Hi, welcome to AmateurLogic.tv, episode 17. I'm George. And I'm Jim. I'm Tommy. And I'm Peter. And it's good to be back again, everyone. We've had a lot of emails this month, and we'll get to those in a minute. Did everybody have a good Halloween? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, it was pretty nice. We stayed here and passed out candy to the kids. Do you have that holiday in Australia, Peter? Oh, we're, we're aware of it, George, but we don't really celebrate it. But it is th- it's slowly coming in. Uh, we don't get the kids coming around doing trick or treat, unfortunately, but uh, it sounds like a bit of fun. Well, George, as you are aware, I spent my Halloween in the hospital having a little minor surgery, but uh, I recovered okay. Didn't really do any trick or treating, but I did get an email. Oh? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I got an email from our old buddy Steve Snort Rosen. And uh, he says, Hi, Jimmy, I finally had some spare time today at lunch to download episode 16, and wow, I am simply stunned. I didn't think you guys could get any better, but you certainly did. And I sincerely mean that. So, he very much enjoyed the interview with Martin Jew, George. And Good. It gave him some real insight, he says, into the man and the company. It did me as well. Thanks for the follow-up on previous segments, especially HR Deluxe and the SDR receiver and software. And he says he's headed to Pacificon to do a little SMT soldering uh, presentation of his own. And he says, George, he'll be sure and mention your video. Thanks, Steve. Cool. Yeah, thanks, Steve. It's always good to hear from people, especially those that we uh, mention in the show from time to time. I've received an email from Ray in Western Australia. Now, Ray is travelling around Australia in a caravan, and he had a query uh, about using a NextG service. Uh, he, he wants to use his NextG service, which is an 850 megahertz uh, service for making phone calls, uh, kind of like uh, mobile uh, telephony. And uh, he wanted some way to kind of increase his distance in much the same way as we've been doing with Wi-Fi. Uh, and what I'd say to you, Ray, is... Uh, uh, I'd uh, go on to Google and do a search for NextG and also do a search for Yagi. Now, the Yagi antenna is a bit like a cut-down television antenna. It, it's also directional and uh, will give you that extra distance. Uh, and uh, it's a little bit uh, more portable than uh, some of the other antennas that we've, uh, we've featured in the show. So uh, do a search on those two, NextG and Yagi, and you'll find a number of vendors that are actually selling these antennas, and they should be able to help you. Well, I've got a, a little series of emails here that are all kind of coincidental or, or good timing or whatever you might want to call them, but uh, let's go over those real quick. I got one from Alan in 9 qkz and he wrote that he just wanted to say we're doing an outstanding job and that he just caught the segment on the uh, software-defined radio kit that I recently built, and he said he had not two hours earlier than that ordered the kit for himself when he found it, and here he found a video showing him the ins and outs of how to put it together. Thanks, Alan. And uh, another uh, sort of coincidence here. I had an email saying, your video has inspired me to uh, give kit building a try, and uh, this writer wanted to know where I got the solder gel paste from. Um, It's actually solder paste, and that came from Cash Olson, whose website I mentioned and it's where I found my details on uh, how to use the hot air method for soldering. But to take it a little further, I did get an email from Cash Olson, KD5SSJ, and he said, I discovered you guys this morning by accident and was surprised to hear my name mentioned. Oh, wow. And had an episode or, uh, or a reference to episode 15 and the hot air method that I published a couple of years ago. He said my experience was similar to tens of hams that he's shown at different ham fests in Texas, New Mexico, Utah, and Arizona. And for a bonus here for our viewers, Cash says that uh, for the first 10 viewers who write him at this email address, he'll send them a free tube of the solder paste. Now, how, oh, wow. How are you going to beat that? Wow. It, Talk about... W- it pays to watch. One coincidence after another, and uh, then we're going to culminate those instances with a special television yeah. offer. <laughs> <And> <laughs> One more uh, little coincidence here. This is from Wink, W-A-8-K-O-Q, and he writes, I just became aware of your great amateur TV program on the Internet as a result of a posting on EHAM. I think Peter does those postings for us. Yep. 
Indeed. He says, wow, I didn't know about you guys. He said, I was especially delighted when watching your demo on the soft rock receiver you built. When you changed to the second signal, you tuned it in, and I heard my call. Oh, no, you're kidding. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, he said, I was the guy replying to W8DUS. <laughs> and if you listen again, I think you'll hear my call, WA8KOQ. Here's a conversation going on in CW right now. Here's the guy replying to him. You hear the uh, two different pitches and tone there. That's because they're on slightly different frequencies. As I fine-tune on him, uh, his pitch will change a little bit. If I turn off the automatic noise reduction, I hear more background noise, but it makes it a little easier to tune and get right on him. If I want to listen to a different CW conversation, I can just grab my little notch here. Thanks, Wink. That is really a wild coincidence there. It is. That's the, the first month that we've had that happen. Amazing. That's, that it really is. Amazing. That's super cool. Yeah, especially people who have never watched the show before. I just tune in, and, and while they're mentioned on it, that's pretty strange. Well, I've got an email. got one here from my friend Kay, Kilo 8 Golf Zulu. She says, uh, you folks are probably getting tired of hearing it, but episode 15 is great. No, Kay, we're not really tired of hearing that. <laughs> <laughs> All of you, Jim, George, Tom, and Peter, done good. I've been a ham for over 50 years, and you guys present ideas and information that makes me rotate my ears in your direction. A big thank you <laughs> and a tip of the hat to you. I'm glad you enjoy it, Kay. We have a lot of fun putting these together every month. Yeah, we sure do, and we really enjoy hearing from you viewers who appreciate the effort that we go to. We're not doing it for the big bucks. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. That's a fact. No, no, we're doing it for the groupies. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Tommy, what is your segment about this month? Oh, man, I found a really awesome website. Uh, it's a repeater database website, and uh, it's got a kind of a unique twist to it. Let's take a look and uh, tell me what you think about it. This month I want to show you about a website that I found. It's a repeater database online, and I know what you're thinking. There are tons and tons of those around. You've probably got a bunch of them already bookmarked. Well, this one's somewhat unique as it interfaces with the Google Maps API. Um, the author, Tom, wrote it to where you can search for some different criteria, call sign, city, state, so forth, as I'll show you in a minute. And it'll bring you to a place on the map centered around what your search result was. And you can actually see where it is and see a circle representing the average range of the repeater and so forth and uh, well actually let's just take a look at it and you see for yourself the URL is uh, k5ehx.net and over on the right hand menu you'll find a link for Google Map repeaters the interface is pretty simple you can enter the call sign a call sign to search for geo search will allow you to enter city and state. Uh, tag search will allow you to enter some text that's in a free form field in the database that you'll see shortly. And the state search does just that. It'll allow you to enter to pull up a listing of all the repeaters in a state. Let's uh, do a search. We'll enter my call sign, just for an example. And you can see there were 12 results returned. Well, you can scroll down and view them. You can actually edit a repeater if you find one that's incorrect. Let's try that. Um, if the save the range, you know the range of this repeater is generally 50 miles. You can come in and edit this and just click submit and change it. And then the circle on the map next time this repeater is drawn will actually be a 50 mile circumference instead of just 30. The author uh, said, uh, had an email and he told me that the data is uh, quite complete for it. Although I, I haven't found anything missing, he said that uh, there were some areas in Pennsylvania that needed some data, and I'm sure there are probably some others. But uh, all the searches that I did for the areas that I'm familiar with came back with a, a very nice listing of each of the repeaters. Um, you can uh, 
click on the zoom link and it'll actually zoom you in really close to the repeater and I see this one I believe is wrong I think that repeaters actually over here on the other side of the highway and uh, I'll have to check on that and possibly update this one myself let's go back down and search for my call sign one more time and populate the listing one once again this uh, like I said before the listing of all the repeaters that were found all 12 of them are here on the left side if you get down to the bottom you can actually download the results you can get them as a comma separated value file or a KML file I'm not familiar with the KML file is so let's uh, get the CSV and we'll take a look at it I'll just save that to my desktop and we'll open up my openoffice.org calc application and here's our listing this is good you can format this and print it if you're going to go on a trip you'll have a listing of repeaters that you can use while you're gone um, trustee the frequency the city state the general range uh, offset and the PL tone and so forth are in here I uh, mentioned the tag search previously and this is the text that's in the tag uh, sort of free forms got the call sign the city the state and the band the, that the repeaters located on um, so, uh, so the data isn't quite complete on here and we can edit it also you can actually add repeaters on here um, let's zoom in some and let's say I knew there was a repeater here at uh, Steelville you click there and it'll pop up a context sensitive menu that you can either get a listing of repeaters that cover that point within 30 miles 100 miles or we can add a new repeater so we can add all the information then the next time someone does a search that covers that area that repeater will show up in the listing I think that's an awesome idea that he left it open to for the ham community to help maintain the data um, that'd be quite a job for one person to undertake um, anyway it's a nice site it's a great idea it's a very unique um, I would encourage you as well as the author does to, to log on there and, and check it out and if you find some data that's not correct uh, you know correct it or add some repeaters if they're missing I did several searches for areas that I'm familiar with and it seems to be pretty complete at least in the areas that I uh, that I'm familiar with the repeaters in so appreciate the author Tom putting that out there and leaving it open for the ham community to maintain the data I think that's a great idea that uh, I think if you search for something on there and you don't find it, take a few minutes and add it if you know know the information for it. And uh, let's keep the thing up to date. It's a great resource for the ham community. Um, anyway, I've got it at one of my bookmarks. I print out a list if I'm going to travel and take it with me now. Uh, anyways, great idea. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Hey Tommy, fantastic segment and talk about coincidences. It couldn't have been timed any better for me. Literally, I'm leaving tomorrow to drive down to the Gulf Coast and I will make use of everything you presented in your segment. Oh, that's cool. It's a, it's a good site. Uh, I actually enjoy it. There's one little thing about the interface. I kind of wish you would make one little change to it. Uh, if you search for all of the repeaters in the state, it, it doesn't work if you spell it out. It's only pairs to be expecting just a two-digit or two-character state abbreviation on there. Tommy, I've got a question about that. Uh, does the uh, the repeater database actually cover places outside the U.S. like Europe and Australia, etc.? Yeah, it, it actually it does. He told me in an email with the uh, the author of it. He sent me a link that said. It, Leaving it open is uh, allowing some pretty interesting things to get put in. And there was a, he sent me a link to a repeater on a little small island out in the ocean. So I'm sure it'll work down, down your way as well. I don't know if it's populated with data down there yet, but you could add them.
I've got an email from Phil in Western Australia, uh, Phil VK6 Alpha Delta Foxtrot, and uh, after hearing my review of the Deegan DE1103, uh, Phil's gone and bought himself a radio, and I hope he's uh, enjoying that now. And he also loved George's uh, MFJ interview, and uh, George, are we going to have some more MFJ uh, material? We'll be having a tour of the MFJ factory later here in this very episode. I've got an email here from Dave, M5TXJ, over in the UK, and he wrote that he just found the show and he's enjoying our vidcast tremendously, and he's going to burn it to DVDs and pass it around at the local ham club, since a lot of people don't have broadband. Uh, he also said he had a little neat device for holding the SMD chips if you're going to solder them with a conventional soldering iron, and it's made from a sprung wooden clothespin. Here's a picture of it. So that's a neat idea, Dave. Thanks for that. Yeah, and pass those DVDs or CDs around. We get a lot of questions about that. No, we don't mind as long as it's non-commercial, right? Right, yeah. We are distributed with a Creative Commons license, and you can follow the link at the end of the credits to learn more about that. Tommy, you've got some more emails? I do. I've actually got two emails here, kind of related to the same subject. Uh, they refer back to my segment on the ATAS-120 uh, HF antenna. One is from our friend uh, Eric, KG4VPV, and also one from Jim, ND6P, and they both uh, bring to my attention that that antenna will also work with the Yesu FT-100 radio and actually I, I did know that but it slipped my mind that I fa failed to mention it in my segment. I appreciate you bringing that to our attention though. And chiming in from Scotland we have an email from David who's doing a little long distance television reception using his Win TV software and a PC and David says hey you guys ever do any of that over in the USA or listen around 55.25 megahertz for television stations on channel 2. It also is a good indicator of 6 meter propagation and if you use some uh, PC analyzer software or here's a nice little tip PSK31 software you can see those video tones and you can even see the meteor pings or meteor scatter so that you can tell when the Meteor E skip or E propagation, sporadic propagation is coming in. Nice tip there, David. David watches a lot. We appreciate that. I do listen on uh, 55 to 25 sometimes, but I've yet to hear any TV on there. Peter, you do a little television experimenting, don't you? Well, not these days, but uh, when I used to live in a rural area in uh, central Victoria, in uh, southern Australia, I uh, we had a pretty pretty clear television reception all around. And uh, what I did was I got a an, an old television antenna and put it onto a pole that I could rotate. And uh, I found that on some days during summer, I was able to receive uh, Auckland Television in New Zealand, uh, Queensland Television, and uh, and also Tasmanian Television. So uh, yeah, when the band uh, up, you can actually receive uh, television reception from many, many miles away. Peter's really our television expert. Now, Peter, you're being modest. You do do a lot of amateur television stuff, don't you? Oh, this sounds very much like a segue uh, there, Jimmy. Uh, I certainly I certainly do a, a bit of uh, amateur television, and uh, uh, it's something that not a lot of people do, uh, and a lot of people, I suspect, uh, or amateurs believe that it's uh, quite difficult to do, but that's not the case. Uh, the equipment's, uh, you can virtually get it off the shelf, and uh, it's quite easy to put a, a television signal out through your local repeater. And uh, seeing as you've mentioned it, gentlemen, uh, how about we have a look at uh, a segment or a tour that I've just produced at George's request of uh, my amateur television equipment. George asked if I could give you a bit of a tour of my amateur television setup, and that's what we're going to do today. While we're at it, we're also going to have a little look at VK3RTV, which is my local amateur television repeater. Now what happens is amateur television operators can transmit up to the VK3RTV repeater on 1250 megahertz and the repeater is located on a nearby mountain. The repeater receives the signal and retransmits it on about 420 megahertz which is in the 70 centimeter amateur television band. Coincidentally this signal can also be received on an ordinary television set for around about 
uh, where UHF Channel 16 is on the UHF television band here in Australia. The first element in an ATV setup is a TV signal source. This can be a VCR, DVD player, video camera or even a computer. Video cards with TV out connections don't tend to give very good performance, so instead I use a box called an AVA key. The AVA key takes the picture that goes to my monitor and turns it into a PAL TV signal. For this demonstration, I have put a digital fish display on my monitor. It's going through the AVA key and I'm displaying the AVA key's output on my TV set. Here is the main element in my ATV setup. It is a small television transmitter designed to send a TV signal to a matching receiver in a home setting. It puts out about 80 milliwatts and is manufactured by a Taiwanese firm called Comtech. There are a number of modifications that can be made to the module to improve its performance. The main problem that I found was that the sound subcarriers were low in volume. The orange wire you see soldered to the board is a homemade solution and brings the sound levels up. The following Canadian website, however, has a number of better modifications you can make to fix this problem and improve the TV picture. Now, I'm legally required to transmit my call sign every 10 minutes. To do this automatically, I use a pickaxe microcontroller to generate my call sign in Morse code. The audio is then fed through a small circuit to make the audio more pleasant to listen to, and this in turn is then wired into the audio input of the video transmitter. To amplify the 1250 MHz television signal, I use an 18 watt power amplifier based on a Mitsubishi module. This is available as a kit from Mini Kits in South Australia. To get my signal up to my antenna, I use a length of low loss Heliax. And here's my antenna. Yes, it's a cantenna, made out of a 1 gallon petrol can. You will note that it is much larger than a 2.4 GHz cantenna due to its lower wavelength. OK, I'm now transmitting a picture of my desktop up to Mount Dandenong. The AvaKey image doesn't quite fill the screen, however there is a button on the AvaKey remote called Overscan, which if I press it, will, will fill the entire screen with the image. Now you'll see that I'm running a DTMF program here. If I press these keys, it will generate DTMF tones, which will be sent up to the repeater. And I can actually remotely control the VK3 RTV repeater uh, using these DTMF tones. If I type star 13 hash, in a couple of seconds, I'll get a signal report from the daughter of one of our local amateurs. Your signal report for today is S5. S5, that's the best signal report you can get. It is a bit mean of us, though, the way that we actually keep her locked up in a room up on top of Mount Daniel, just so she can do signal reports for us all the time. My next thing that I'm going to do is to press star zero one hash. That's going to give me a color bar. There we are. And uh, a tone in, in a couple of seconds. In the meantime, there's the VK3 R2V station identification scrolling across the screen. Now I can reset the repeater by pressing 4 on the DTMF pad. There we are, and it will turn me back to the desktop in a second or two. And there we are. Well, that finishes our tour of the VK3 RTV repeater and of my own setup. Hopefully that might have inspired you to go out and get your own amateur television setups and try your hand at it. It really isn't that difficult. See you later. Peter, that was real interesting, your demonstration on amateur television there. I've never dabbled with it here myself, and I didn't know exactly what you could do with it. And, you know, how do y'all feed that girl in the box? With great difficulty. <laughs>
do you actually carry some programming on there uh, sometime rather than oh, just static raised, images? You've, so? you've uh, raised a very interesting topic there, uh, George. Uh, as you may be aware, uh, amateur radio and or television uh, is not allowed to broadcast entertainment, and so we can't uh, 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 broadcast, uh, you know, uh, typical programs that you would see on commercial or government television. However, we are able to show, I suppose, some home videos and uh, uh, some uh, radio-related uh, material. Interestingly enough, uh, for people in the US, uh, you actually have a special dispensation whereby, by that I mean a special rule or a special law, whereby uh, amateur television operators in the United States are allowed to retransmit NASA television. It's something that we don't have here in Australia, but I think it's a great idea and it's something that I'd really love to see in the, in the future. You could probably transmit the amateur logic episodes and we've never been accused of being entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, in general, yes, uh, I think it's uh, it's probably okay. Um, what I do uh, transmit, though, on a Friday night is uh, uh, I actually put up a fish broadcast, uh, and you would have seen a little bit of that in the uh, the segment. And uh, after that, uh, around about 10 o'clock in the evening, uh, we've got a fellow amateur who transmits... Uh, a local net on 80 metres. He transmits the audio of that, and it's all about astronomy uh, and all the. Uh, it's like a news service about uh, the latest happenings in astronomy here in Victoria, and uh, he puts up a few slides and uh, videos to kind of accompany that. And he's been doing that for a number of years. Uh, uh, that's Gary VK3KHB, and uh, he's uh, uh, his his work is very much appreciated here in Victoria. That's very cool. We should get more. Um astronomy and amateur related activities tied together some way over here. Well I have an email here from a viewer in South America. This is from Leonardo PY2GLO in Brazil and he writes that he watched our last episode and wanted to say that he really appreciates the work that we're doing and it's very interesting, instructive and important to the hams all over the world. He said he loved it and uh, he said he's been a radio amateur since 1975 in the Master Brazilian category. He's an electronics engineer since 1979, and he's director of Pace Electronics in Brazil Limited. Wow, cool. I got a lot of PY2s in my log. Propagation's pretty good between uh, here and Brazil. I've got a message here from Brett in New South Wales, and uh, Brett, uh, VK2TMG, writes to ask us whether we could run a story on EME, which is Earth to Moon to Earth radio transmission, and that involves transmitting a very, very powerful radio signal uh, towards the moon. The signal gets uh, bounced off the face of the moon and hopefully received very weakly here in Australia. Now to do this you uh, you need uh, <laughs> huge antennas, a huge power output, um, none of which I possess unfortunately so uh, I don't think I can help you there Brett. Uh, maybe the guys in the US can uh, possibly help you out. Uh. Actually I'd suggest you uh, look at YouTube and do a search for EME or moon bounce and you'll come up with some videos there. I saw some uh, where a guy was talking on a radio and then his signal was repeating back to him a second or two later. Now you didn't see his antennas or any of the other gear, so I don't know whether he's actually doing moon bounce or not, but it appeared that he was. And You know, last month uh, we had an interview with Martin F. Jew, the founder and president of MFJ Enterprises, and this month we're going to go back to the MFJ factories. I recently visited there, you know, during their 35th anniversary celebration, and uh, I convinced Richard Stubbs, who's a customer service manager there, to give us a tour of the factory. And here's what we saw. This is what we really do well, is uh, manufacture ham products. We start with a blank board. This one has actually gotten surface mount, and you'll see that later, more of the technology uh, up front and close and personal. This is our automatic tuner line. This is our newest product line that we have. We range in retail price from $219.95 all the way to $699 on the end. That is a full legal limit automatic tuner. We just came out. It just nice. started gracing the pages of our catalog. And uh, it's a very popular product line for us now too. So we have devoted a full line to that. Whereas it, when it first started, it was a very few people. Of course, we, you know we got high competition there too. You got LDG competing there right. and SGC. But some of their products on that end are at $1,200. We're on the low end at $6.99, but we think our product's better. And these ladies think it's better too. So what they got, they'll come out here with the blank PC board, and then after it's been surface mount, 
they'll come out here, they'll hand stuff the boards as she's doing right there, and it'll walk itself down the line. It'll get PC board tested. It'll get run through the, the wave solder machine, and then it'll get final tested by uh, in-line tester on the end. And right here, you also notice, this is a real interesting thing here, our analyzers are used throughout our testing procedures. Most of the guys that are inline testers, they have an SWR analyzer from MFJ that is used to uh, test the products. Those products are able to do a lot of different things. They can test roller inductors to make sure the contact wheel is making contact on the coil and uh, so on. So this is, uh, he's also got one of our Ameritron amps here to test for power. This is Sam here. He's doing the uh, Mirage VHF UHF amplifiers. Sam is, uh, I think, uh, one of about three people running the entire company on this line. We did take some of the Mirage amps to the Ameritron uh, factory so they okay. could do more of the uh, high volume sales stuff. He does a lot of the uh, commercial, the uh, 220, 440 megahertz amplifiers and the business band. Uh, everything on Mirage is hand stuffed, hand soldered, uh, handmade. I talk to a lot of hams that buy a new house and they don't want to mm -hmm. drill a hole in their house and their wife surely doesn't want them to. So we have came up with the idea where you can shut the window, cut this down to size and put your coax feed points and all your insulators through here and then that way you don't drill a hole through your house. Also very popular now is this VH, I mean uh, HF giant watt meter. Yeah, that's nice. Uh, this is something that the hams can see. Now this is a massive line. It kind of looks like a lot of garbage, but we got so many different products up here. These are all models of the different things they build, and it's a wide array of products. We go from uh, SO2R switch, which is brand new. We're just now finally getting out. Uh, that's You switch between two radios and two microphones. We got our uh, uh, conditioner where you can tailor your voice to go up or mm -hmm. down in, in pitch if I want to go lower. You got your uh, noise canceling antenna if you got a power line fence or some other signal that's causing a problem. That has been something in yes. particular of interest to me I want to play with one day. Good, good. Well you know you can try it out. Oh uh, well. <laughs> You're uh, welcome to it. We'll do it. Hey make that your first uh, yeah, I'm uh, review. Yeah. You got the speech intelligibility en enhancer. You know Mr. Jew came out and, and, you know, he's, he's such a neat guy. Sometimes he'd come out with a full-page advertisement. You remember the old advertisement where, where you took somebody's picture and said, hey, there's something wrong with me? Yeah. He said, I had a left ear hearing problem. This device he made for himself. When you talk about how he designed some products that mm -hmm. were for different reasons, this one he actually made for himself to enjoy his ham radio because his left ear, he can't hear. In, in fact, if he's talking to you, sometimes he'd do this, you know, so he could hear better. So what he did was he created like a graphic equalizer that would allow him to hear in his left ear as well as his right ear. The other things are the voice keyer, keyer reader, the uh, sound card radio interfaces. Mm -hmm. These are popular to go to, for decoding digital data. We also make the voice keyer on this line. This is where you can uh, push a button, CQ, CQ. This is KC5 NSZ. You can go cute as Mississippi. You can add in other phrases in here. We also make these for Morse code, the same thing, where a guy's got on his paddle, all he has to do is hit a button, and it'll do the same thing in Morse code. We have right. single sideband CW rigs. These were very popular in the 90s, and you know there used to be a dedicated newsletter to 90 series radios from MFJ. We had the 5-watt transceivers and the 10-watt uh, uh, sideband rigs. Now we've got like a little 2.5-watt. This is a 40-meter transceiver in the palm of your hand. Wow. You can take this backpacking, put an antenna on it, get a little key and a paddle, which we sell also, and then you've got a full radio in the palm of your hand and you put it in your backpack and go, go do your other hobbies like hiking and, and backpacking. This is another new area for us, the Wi-Fi. Uh, there's a finished product there. This is the 15 dBi Yagi. And what we do with this, you can hook this, this up to your computer and uh, steer it out to Holiday Inn Express. I shouldn't mention any names out there or wherever yeah. and uh, try to get some bandwidth. So is this, is this going to work as good as my Cantenna? Uh, oh, you got a Cantenna that yeah. does the same thing for Wi-Fi? Uh, basically, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. We've been selling a lot of these. This is a 15 dBi, uh, 16, I think it was 16 elements. Well, it probably is as good as a can. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. and it sells for 29.95. The thing is, the cable, which are hard to get, 
sell for twenty four ninety five. Yeah. So the cable's <laughs> almost as much as the antenna. That's the uh, MFJ two fifty nine B and the two sixty nine. The SWR analyzers one go one covers one point eight to one seventy. The other one covers one point eight to one seventy plus four fifteen to four seventy. We're in process. We're trying to work on one that'll be continuous coverage, which is what everybody wants, and obviously the commercial uh, companies do. And right here is where they stuff all the through-hole parts. You can see there's quite a few still left to go. And what we do is we put them in there, and you can see that the ribbon cable is still loose, and none of these traces have been soldered. We also put tape on the bottom because we're going to run this through the wave solder machine. All these points at that point will be soldered. Now the surface mount components have already been soldered once because they went through an oven and they got they got uh, soldered in there, but then they'll get soldered again. So that's why we do that. Right here, these boards have already been finished. They are ready to go up the line. This is the 269 board. And as you can see, what it was, a lot of people didn't even realize this, is basically this was the add-on part. This is the 415 to 470 megahertz. So when we first came out that with that, we had some initial problems. They weren't going on 450 or mm -hmm. get stuck in UHF or something. That's because you got two parts working together. Well, it took some more super diodes, and now that problem's been fixed. But that board is a massive-looking project right there. <laughs> now, we do have one that takes a little bit longer. That new automatic tuner takes uh, 30 minutes in the surface mount machine. It's got over 500 surface mount wow. components that are stuffed. This Pearl jumps from from desk to desk, she usually comes down here and does these analog meter assembly, get these ready for Miss Louise. So she's already put the analog meters in and, and the SO239 connector mm -hmm. and the banana stud. And then uh, it'll step on down the line. These are the models that we build. These are the two finished products right here. Right here we have a coil winder for our roller inductors that we actually build here now. A lot of people don't realize that. We, we used to buy uh, products from various different companies uh, and then now we're we took out the middleman we make them ourselves uh, the roller inductors the capacitors for the big tuners uh, also the coils these are coils that uh, we used to have to buy from a company but now we manufacture these in our metal shop we they're actually in a big long tube and then we cut them down to size these are used in tank circuits for Ameritron they're used in antenna designs for mm -hmm. like bug catchers and uh, mini screwdrivers also, these are used in all these various different uh, sizes of tuners. You can see there's different sizes of coils. So uh, we will take these out then to the lines and put them in the antenna tuners. They're working on roller inductors. There's that slinky that we were talking about that was made from the coil winder. Uh, Miss Annie here does all the roller inductor pr uh, production and all the capacitor production. Earlier she was working on capacitors. Now she's working on uh, roller inductors. And all of these capacitors are the models that we build right here. All right, so y'all don't import any of these air variables anymore. Well, all... now, the smaller ones we do. Okay. There, there are some of the, the little 300 watt tuners are, are still imported capacitors, mm -hmm. but we go all the way down to, I think this was the 125 picofarad. Is that, I think so. I think you need a, a 70. <laughs> <laughs> we go 125 up to 500 picofarad. I think that's the one for the Ameritron uh, tuner, the antenna tuner for Ameritron ATR30. And then we make all the roller inductors. And our most expensive roller inductor, most expensive part that we sell and manufacture ourselves is this air wound, I mean edge wound, uh, uh, silver plated uh, roller inductor. This is $95.80 as a part. And mm -hmm. we're selling these like crazy to people all over the world. That are built. There's still a well, lot of hams building their own projects. Well, you can't really find roller inductors just anywhere. No, no, no. And that's and that's another one of Mr. Jew's dreams. He was talking to you about dreams. Mm -hmm. He wanted to become a parts house. That's why you see now uh, in our new catalog, we're starting to. We always offered all the parts, but now we are actually showing that we offer them. So we took let's, pictures of all of them. Let's and have we a, actually, uh, a closer look at this one right here. Uh, you said you call this edge? Edge wound, uh, silver plated. That and goes in our ATR30. It also goes in our 2500 watt continuous carrier MFJ tuner. Well, I see here this is very similar to the commercial ones I am use, I used in broadcasting. Mm. Um, with that contact there, that's, that makes a good firm contact. Oh, yeah, that's, that's solid. And this fiberglass is a little heavier duty than, than some of the other ones in the mm. other. The, 
you know, we, we go like 1500 watts coming down. This is for the really high power one here. You'll see that model on this end. Right here is where we do those coils. This is how they come out from our metal shop. And then uh, we're going to cut them down to size right here. And she's hardwiring all the switches to the coils. This is for all the little 300 watt, right. 200 watt tuners. We got a 300 watt switched inductor uh, antenna tuner. You got a 300 watt uh, roller inductor antenna tuner with the air core rollers that they designed on this end. Then you step up to about an 800 watt PEP mm -hmm. there, and then 1500 watts. And then we've got finally our big bad boy on the end. It's 2500 watts continuous carrier antenna wow. tuner. This one's got the silver plated edge wound. This is the model, so this is not looking as pretty as those ones down there. We're going to run power from our 1500 watt amplifier here. This is the AL82 into our 989D. He's got a 1500 watt uh, can dummy load back there mm -hmm. with oil and then also a bird watt meter as usual to, to calibrate that meter to the standard of the bird. This is also where we build the other part of the Vectronics line. These were all similar products to the MFJ line. Yeah. If you remember, in 1996, this was a brand that was really being pushed by Tucker, a company down in Texas. So we kind of more or less bought out our competition at that point. They were, they were competition, but we also wanted that other name. Physically, these tuners are different than the just, MFJs. Just a little bit. You know what? We, we took, we borrowed some from Vectronics that was, that was some of the things that we liked. And then we took some of our stuff and put it into their tuners. For instance, they had a, this is a 48 position inductor switch, which was kind of odd, but it's kind of neat too, as long as you catch it right in the middle where mm -hmm. it's supposed to go. So you got 48 positions rather than a 12 position. But mainly, uh, some of these products are basically the same. In fact, we used our air core roller inductor once we bought the company instead of what they had. They had the old Delrin type material on the inside, yeah. which we found that a lot of hams or maybe non hams were burning up and melting. So we decided to start using the air core, and that's why MFJ made that change too. We went to an air core, and we don't have that problem anymore. It's hard to burn up air. Of course, some, some guys can yeah. still do it. <laughs> some guys run that much power, yeah. This was actually a unique story. This DSP filter was actually our first surface mount board. And a lot of people wonder why, because DSP is built in every radio there is now, especially the ones up front. But there are a lot of old ICOM, I mean old radios out there yeah. that don't have DSP. So we still sell a lot of these boards. And, um, you know, we basically have to redesign boards in order to use the surface mount. So that was yeah. another reason why at that time, that was probably 10 years ago, when we got the surface mount capability, that that was one of the leading products to do. Um, you know, as time went on, obviously, we went to those analyzers. Uh, right here, we're, what we're working on today on this line is the 200-watt deluxe model. This is a 200-watt... PEP sideband tuner in the palm of my hand. Well, this one's actually the palm of my hand. This was the original product that Mr. Jew came up with. It's the tiny travel tuner. Mm -hmm. And then this is the kind of the after effect. We always offer something like you say, $10 up, $10, $20 yeah. up, $30 up. This one is uh, $89.95. This one goes to $139.95. So with the extra money, you get a meter, you get a uh, ballon, and you get a um, you know a larger larger tuner. So this one you get just the bare bones and necessities. So what's nice about this? Throw this in a backpack, and you've got a nice yeah. little radio, and uh, you can go up on the mountaintop with that as well. That's that little stack toroid again. You can see how many of those we're getting ready to push out. That's that little 200 watt. It's three stack toroids in and there. This is the, the, the place of the inductor, switch, yeah. right? Instead of the coil, you got the yeah. three stacked in, uh, toroids. All right, this is the wave solder room. I'll show you what uh, we had to go to a no lead solder. Our previous machine um, was an old dinosaur looking thing. It was really big and uh, everything was wide open. There was no top to prevent anybody from getting burned. Mm -hmm. uh, it was pretty wild. But this is the new no lead solder bar that we use. So when he wants to melt this solder, he would just stick it down in the tank, and it would melt. And he's going to run us a board here. We go across a uh, flux material on this end. You can see the, the soaps, soapy, sudsy area. 
It's going to take off the dust particles of the board, but then it's also going to put a sticky residue on the bottom where the solder pad is. And then at this point, it's going to go across a preheating element. It's almost like a barbecue grill under there. It's got some iron rods. Yeah. And then at the top part, you'll w witness that being soldered. The previous machine, uh, it would run across there. You really had to watch the height. Of course, this one you got to too, but and there is some cleanup on this one, but the other one was getting to be a lot of heavy maintenance. And you also could not pick up the jig, or you could pick up the jig right after it went off the soldering area. Now this one is actually hot to the touch. Oops. Plain as a whistle. Yep. That saved a lot of time right there. Oh, no doubt, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now what, is that gold? Gold? Is there some gold in the solder? No, or? I think that's just some stuff some you got to clean up, right? The copper right. that's coming out in there, or what? Yeah, there's a thing down there that you can clean it every so often. The old machine was real nasty. This one, you know, it has it's pretty new. We've had this for about seven months, I think. But you can see where you know it's getting yeah. getting a little bit clean up. So it, it is a nasty process, but as long as you keep it going and maintain the machines, it's it's uh, really helps out a lot, obviously. We would hate to solder all those connections, but we used to do that. This is where we got all of our chips and inductors and resistors and all of our money is sitting here waiting to go out the door. Another neat thing I like to show off in here is three shelves of through hole boards. These are all PC boards that are still hand stuffed. So, yeah. and people ask us, why do you do that when you got the fancy machine next door? Well. You can't redesign everything. It costs too much money to redesign everything to go to surface mount. So a lot of these parts, five, ten a month maybe in sales. We've already engineered it. Mm -hmm. Mr. Jew engineered it 25 years ago. Well, as a ham, I would probably rather have the through hole component so I could repair it myself. Right. Well, exactly. Mm -hmm. But anything for speed, obviously, we're going well, to yeah. surface mount it. Mm -hmm. We have a stencil for every PC board that we surface mount. Like I said, there's the uh, the 10 boards that do for the uh, 461 code reader and the code tutor. Mm -hmm. They do that one all at once. Every surface mount board that we have has a stencil that we put on this machine. And Sandra is actually disassembling it, but you can kind of see the solder paste she's going to wipe clean here. It's a, a material sort of like a paste. Yeah. Um, and it's going to come off of there and get squeegeed into the holes just where we want the solder to, solder paste to go. So that's why you need the stencil. That's why we okay. need the stencil. Nice. After the solder paste has been squeegeed into the holes, there's a little pad of solder right in this location. Uh, most of the boards take very little time to go through these machines. The 269 that we paid a lot of attention to out on the line mm -hmm. on the analyzer line takes nine minutes through this machine. And as we talked about, the big automatic tuner takes 30 minutes. It's got 500 parts that are stuck. Yeah. Uh, this particular board probably takes a couple of seconds, actually, probably 30 or so seconds. Now, Sandra, these machines are actually already obsolete. Uh, she actually hand stuffs some of these parts on the board by hand because we do not have an arm that will pick this part up and take it to the board. So that is a problem. But it's not a problem for her because she's busy doing it all day long. She can handle it. Now right in here, this is the surface mount machine. And when that's running, you can see the computer is, is constantly uh, changing the style, changing the little uh, numbers that are coming up on the screen. It's telling these arms. These are little vacuum arms that come over to these reels. And the components are on the reels picking up the parts by vacuuming up, kind of sucking them up in there, taking them to the PC board, and shooting them back down onto the solder paste. Now, if something goes wrong and it drops one, uh, there, there's some, some parts in here that drop down into the tank that Sandra will actually clean out later, and I'll show you the toolbox that she puts them in. The red light would come on the machine, and then it would tell her, hey, we got to redo that step. So, once that board is completed, Sandra will actually check it out, hand stuff these parts over here, and then she will take it to the oven after she says it's okay. So when these come off, they are a little hot to the touch, as you can feel there, but now they've been oh, soldered, yeah. mm -hmm. and they are silvery and shiny. All that solder paste has been soldered at that point, and all these boards are coming off, 
You can see they take a beating. They're not going to knock off any parts. They're, they're sticking to it hard because as these boards come off, they're landing on top of each other. So this is really just an oven here. Everything is ready an and it just needs to be heated by the time it gets to this machine. Yeah, if we get a, a pizza that can survive 270 mm -hmm. degrees, we can put it on there too. It looks kind of like Quiznos <laughs> here. <laughs> now this is one of the tape or one of the reels here off components. That is a reel, that's a 1.2k ohm resistor. Can we show? You can go on and on and on. This is, this is a uh, 5,000 pieces of uh, part number 100S-3150, which is a, a quarter watt resistor. Uh, it's not just on this one day. We do it all the time, all 365 days a year. Thank you. Appreciate you. Well, Wayne, I want to thank you for being our cameraman today. I couldn't have done it without you. That's my pleasure. My pleasure. And wh what did you think about what we saw today? Pretty impressive, huh? It was. Um, I've never seen that much stuff done. I've only tinkered and dabbled with uh, wires and solder, and that was just a little bit overwhelming for me. <laughs> of course, I know it's nothing for them, but it was It was definitely very interesting to see. Yeah. It sure puts my little dinky projects to shame, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> it does. I really appreciate uh, Mr. G talking with us. That was very enlightening to hear that from him. and. Uh, interesting things I didn't know about him. True. Same. So hopefully uh, we can uh, get to see some more of the plants that they have here for the different companies and uh, get a little bit better idea of what's going on up here at MFJ. Yeah. Hopefully in the morning we'll get to see uh, High Gain, uh, Ameritron, uh, Vectronics. Vect well, we saw some of the Vectronics here, yeah. but the metal shop, I think those are the three buildings that are right. we haven't That's visited. Right. Plus, there's some other activities going on here with the ARRL, and uh, maybe we'll see some of that too. Could be. Supposed to have a pretty good swap fest. Keeping my fingers crossed, maybe it will. But right now, we're headed to the cookout, and we'll see y'all later. Take care. Okay, wow, what a tour, man, what a factory. I don't know if that's uh, what most people would think of as a ham radio factory, but it really looked impressive to me, especially those soldering machines, all that kind of stuff. I would, I would not have expected that. I don't know. I think I thought there would just be like a bunch of people in a long line, but now that you think about it, uh, uh, surface mount technology, you got to have a machine of some sort, but that was really impressive. It was impressive. You know, it, what's really impressive to me is the lineup of uh, gear that those guys have and, and how they make it out of necessity. Like uh, the one that strikes me is the the equalizer Martin made for his hearing, you know, for his HF rig yeah. to, so he can hear it and uh, operate better. And now it's a product that they sell. It's pretty cool stuff. I've never been in any other electronics factories except for a guitar amplifier factory 25 years ago or so. and. Uh, it was a little bit different than this, but uh, it was real interesting going through there. Everybody was real friendly. Um, the people enjoyed what they were doing. And I'd like to go back again in another three years or so whenever they have another open house there. But, you know, the invitation's open. Anyone who wants to visit MFJ and Starkville, they'll give you a tour whenever you go. And we'll be back next month with either a tour of the High Gain Factory or a tour of the Ametron Amplifier Plant, uh, which are both... Uh, well-known, well-respected brands, and I think you'll enjoy what we show you there, too. Well, I've got an email from Steve in Chicago. It says, uh, I'm a big fan of Amateur Logic and have become very interested in obtaining some ham radio licenses. I went to the ARR website, AR, that's almost a tongue twister, the ARRL website to find some training material and stumbled across Ham Test Online. Purchased their two-year subscription. Anyway, after spending some time, he found out it was uh, mostly just a bunch of questions, and he wants to put some information on getting some theory. Uh, well, Steve, the uh, ARRL handbook for uh, radio communications is a good source for such as that, um, and uh, some of our viewers may actually have some suggestions for some other sources as well. Yeah, as a matter of fact, the ARRL has a book for studying and passing the test, that has the theory in it, and I highly recommend it. I obviously don't remember the name off the top of my head, but you, you'll find it if you peruse their website. Yeah, when it comes to passing those exams, though, I don't think you'll be able to beat the uh, question and answer method. 
just go through and uh, read the question and then only read the correct answer. Don't bother reading the incorrect answers and you'll nail the test. And I've got an email here from Jason down in ZL2 land. ZL2FT is Jason's call. And he says he's been watching Amateur Logic now for about seven months. He really enjoys the interesting content. He, as in fa matter of fact, has Ham Radio Deluxe now and has an interface with his ICOM IC7400 rig. And he enjoyed the segment on the HF beacons. It's a good deal. Uh, but what he's really getting into recently are the digi modes. He says there's a lot of growth down in uh, New Zealand on the 30 meter ham band. Uh, right around 10 dot, uh, 140 megahertz, and there was a PropNet uh, weekend a few weeks back, and a lot of the stations from the USA were coming in pretty clear, and he only had a couple of folks from down under, but he said it's real interesting to see that, and uh, that in case any of us want to get into it, here's the link to the PropNet site, and it's pretty simple, it's www.propnet.org, just like you'd think, so... Thanks, Jason, from, i got to say the name of this town where he lives. It's, it's unbelievable. Wanganui, New Zealand. Peter, how did I do on that pronunciation? Uh, pretty good. Uh, Wanganui is, the, uh, I think, the proper pronunciation. Isn't that what you said, Jim? Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> That's what I was shooting for. <laughs> Well, we hope you've enjoyed episode 17. As always, we've sure had a lot of fun uh, producing it, bringing it to you. Keep your Wanganui hanging loose. <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving, whatever other holidays you got coming up. This is a holiday season, and we'll see you all again soon. See you next time right here. See you. Bye. <laughs>